Good morning. Good morning. It's a little intimidating. It's theater in the round here. It's what a wonderful day, wonderful time. Thank you all for coming. This is a one of many times we remind ourselves about the importance of philanthropy. And this is, I, I'm told to remind everybody, but I don't think I need to, that Phil is short for philanthropy. And Phil was and is here among us. And we often think about philanthropy in terms of just the dollars. But I really think our role here at the university is to help all of us become leaders who make a difference in our world. And the world really needs us. It needs all of you individually and needs all of us collectively. We're all part of something bigger. And often we go into our corners and think about what we belong and we get divisive with one another. And this is just a moment to kind of all hug and all remind ourselves why we're here and how we can play a bigger role. And we have no better way of doing that than celebrating the rock stars among us. And I have the pleasure of introducing Kaylin here in a moment, who will introduce our main speaker. But Kathy Dorr is an innovator in the media industry par excellence. But forget that. What she's done to help connect people together in their lives, particularly women on our campus. Kaylin is actually a recipient of the, of the scholarship, one of the scholarships, many scholarships, that Kathy Dorr has provided. Kaylin is a second year student in our MBA program. She's a leader in that cohort, as well as across the Tippie College of Business. Interestingly enough, Kaylin, I didn't know until a few moments ago, comes to us from that nearby community within our midst of the state of Alaska. <laughs> so Kaylin, Simon, Chapik, please come forward, introduce our guest speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Harold. It is a true honor to be here to introduce someone who has such a who has made such a significant impact on my scholastic and professional journey. As President Harold said, my name is Kaylin Simon Chapik, and I'm a full-time MBA student here, and I'm also the Kathleen Dorr and Henry B. Tippy Women's Leadership Scholar. Iowa, in many ways, has really become home for me over the last year, thanks to the MBA program support and the support I have received from the Tippy College of Business. Additionally, the philanthropy from individuals in the university community has a huge impact on shaping who we are and how we grow as individuals. I can truly say that I would not be here today without UI's philanthropy, or Phil, as we refer to it here at Iowa. I grew up understanding the value of Phil and how giving back can empower others. As President Harold said, I'm from Alaska. I grew up in a very small uh, commercial fishing village um, with one of the lowest per capita state student budgets, uh, or lowest per capita student budgets for the school in the state. So the community really had to make up the difference for us. The people of my town fundraised for volleyball meets, science competitions, and everything in between. These experiences were possible because the community supported the students in every way it could. Because of this inspiration, I've worked to give back with my time and also my full-time work in nonprofit advocacy. Today's guest speaker partners with Tippy to provide leadership opportunities for our full-time female MBA students through her philanthropic support. As the Door Tippy MBA scholarship recipient, I'm fortunate to benefit directly from Kathy Door's dedication to women's leadership, and I continue to develop my understanding of philanthropy as I plan and support women's programming through the MBA program. Over the past year, my female classmates and I have spent numerous lean-in lunches covering tip topics from everything from gender bias in the workplace to personal brandings. We spend our Sundays, our Fridays in trainings, um, practicing salary negotiations and learning about personal branding. Uh, we have opportunities to connect with the impressive co cohort of female to be alumni, such as Kathy herself. In fact, this past week, we were in Atlanta um, for company visits and leadership panel discussions with female Tippie alumni for Coca-Cola and Kimberly Clark. To quote another MBA student, this program has truly been the highlight of my time in the MBA program, and I couldn't agree more. 
The Door Tippy Women's Leadership Program is truly shaping our female leaders and contributing to the, way, to the women of the program in a way that MBA classes alone simply cannot. Kathy's support and dedication to empowering our women has been vital to shaping our experience here at Tippy, and we can't thank her enough. Kathy, thank you for all you have done to support me, my peers, and the University of Iowa. You can't really clap with a mic in your hands, it turns out. Um, now I'm honored to introduce Kathy Dorr to share her journey and commitment to philanthropy here at Iowa. Kathy is a media innovator who received both her BA and MBA from the University of Iowa. She is currently the Senior Advisor of Vision and Strategy for consulting firm Proteus Incorporated, and she previously served as President of Broadcasting at CanWest Media and President of Entertainment Networks for Rainbow Media, overseeing cable networks AMC, IFC, WE, and Bravo. Kathy currently chairs the board of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement and has given back to the UI's Department of Communication Studies and the Henry B. Tippey College of Business. Kathy has served on the UI Alumni Association Board of Directors and the Board of Visitors for the Tippey College of Business. She received the UI Alumni Association's Distinguished Alumni Award for Achievement in 1998, was named Women of, Woman of the Year in 2003 by Women in Cable Telecommunications, and has been among Hollywood Reporter's annual list of 100 Most Powerful Women. I would now like to invite Kathy Dorr to the stage, along with Lynette Marshall, President and CEO of the UI Center for Advancement. Thank you, Lynette, for being here today to engage in this Life with Phil discussion. Thank you so much. That was really nice. Thanks. Thank you, Kaylin. What a nice job you did. And we're really happy to have you here and representing the support that Kathy has provided. And welcome back and welcome home to you, Thank Kathy. You. Thank really, you, Annette. Really it's nice. It's great to be here. And it's great to be in what appears to be a television studio. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. You are probably more comfortable in this space than any of the rest of us in the room. So <laughs> happy to have you, although you didn't spend lots of time in front of the yeah, camera. I don't that's think true. <laughs> So you grew up in Iowa City and um, obviously spent some of your uh, formative years here as well as getting your degree from the University of Iowa. Uh, I thought we might just start with talking a little bit about how you think that um, really informed your career interests and your interest in going into television initially. Well, I think um, I grew up, I, I moved here when I was nine. So, um, Iowa, first of all, and, and being in Iowa, I moved, my family moved from Ohio, and I think growing up in Iowa um, sort of gave me a, a very basic sense of um, Midwest values, which you know I, I talk about a lot in terms of how they've of impacted me. Um, I also, at a very young age, felt like I sort of spent every day on campus because. I went to grade school um, and, uh, across the street from what's now the Tippy College of Business. Mm -hmm. And so I remember standing on the playground as a nine and 10 year old and you know, watching the students change classes and thinking, well, wouldn't it be cool to be one of them? And I walked home every day, sort of through campus across the footbridge and over to the west side. And, um, Burge Hall was a relatively new dorm in those days, and they had cherry coke, I remember, which you know, you could, you, we could have every, every so often. Um, my parents took us to probably a, one football game a season. So, you know, I feel like I grew up with the University of Iowa really permeating my being. Um, my father was a business leader in town. He, um, ran what was then Owens Brush Company, what's now Oral-B. And my mother had been an actress in college and, and um, before we moved to Iowa in, in community theater. So I think, you know, I, I sort of think of my parents as um, motivating and encouraging my interest in both things that I, that I ended up doing. And so, I, you know, I think all of that um, gave me kind of the basis for what what I thought I wanted to do, um, how I thought I wanted to live my life, and a real uh, attachment to university communities and higher education. How interesting. 
I didn't realize about your mother's um, interest yeah. in acting. That, that fits in nicely with your story. Well, that's where I, st I started out, you know, as a kid thinking I wanted to be an actor. And uh -huh. I sort of, that sort of morphed into, as you say, not in front of the camera, but behind the camera yeah. and, and yeah. television and film. Very nice, very nice. So as you um, thought about that, and you thought about your own career journey, you didn't start at the University of Iowa. Right, right. I, you know, I, I grew up here, and when you grow up here, as those of you know who may, may be from Iowa City, you know, half of your classmates at least go to the University of Iowa. So I wanted that sort of going away to college experience. So mm -hmm. I went to the University of Missouri for two years. And then I transferred back here. Um, you know, I, I think, so this was, I transferred back here in 1970. And so there was a real difference across the country from campus to campus in terms of sort of, again, a value and cultural difference that I don't think I realized until I went um, to a different and, I would say, more conservative campus, the magnitude of those differences. Mm -hmm. So I came back here and um, I came back here as a junior and um, I, th I think that experience uh, at that time sort of, I think, said to all of us that, you know, life is really very precious. That was the first year of the draft lottery. Our classmates were you know, leaving and not coming back. And it also sort of instilled in me a sense that you, know, you, need, to do so you need to do something that's giving back, that's making a difference in the world. And I wasn't sure quite, I mean, I really liked entertainment and I liked business and I wasn't sure how I was gonna do that change the world thing in, in television and film, but I think Subconsciously, the University of Iowa gave me that kind of underlying first sense of giving back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, like many of us, right out of school, you didn't necessarily jump into <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the job that you would have 25 years later, of course. Can you describe a little bit of that journey for our students here today and how some of those initial employment opportunities really informed than getting to the place where you wanted to be and working in, in the media? Yeah, I think I worked for seven different organizations between the time I was 21 and 30. And none of them were in television, and um, you know, most of them were in the, the nonprofit sector. Um, so the first 10 years were kind of like a bouncing, bouncing ball. Uh, and I guess, um, you know, I, I think that by the time I got my first job in television, which was, um, I think, at age 31, um, that I felt like th my undergraduate degree had given me a real um, basis in media, an understanding of media. You know, I could actually operate a television camera, and I could make a short film, and I understood, you know, sort of what was happening in that industry. So that was a broad base. Um, I had become interested in the financial services industry in that bouncing around decade, and so I decided to pursue an MBA. Uh, you know, I had no real business coursework as, a, as an undergrad. And so um, I, I think that the MBA gave me two things. It gave me that coursework, it gave me the understanding and the, the knowledge and the basics of a lot of areas of study that, that you know, I, just, I was not confident in, accounting and statistics and, and finance. Um, and it also gave me a, a, a credential, and I think that credential ended up being really important, I think more and more important because I was a woman and in that generation. So, uh, you know, the, those two degree, the two degrees really came together. The other thing, you know, interestingly, that my uh, experience, my early work experience gave me, uh, actually the University of Iowa gave me, um, was the, my first opportunity to manage people. Mm -hmm. And I was, I served as uh, associate director of the Alumni Association here at Iowa for four years. And that was my first opportunity to really manage um, a team of people, and I liked it. and. And um, I think that also then very much directed my career in that direction of, of management. 
And then after your MBA, was your next role then in media? Did it, did so, it go? Well, so closely? after my MBA was a lot of years. So I, um, I uh, studied as part of the professional, what they call the professional MBA now, which is a great way. We said night school. And um, <laughs> so, and it, um, it, so I took one or two classes a semester. I didn't have any business undergrad, so it was a 60-hour MBA, and it took me seven years mm -hmm. to complete the MBA. So I actually, um, my last two um, semesters, I actually commuted weekly from Chicago, where I was doing my first job in television, okay. back to Iowa City to take those last few courses. Um, so it taught me a lot about persistence, yeah. <laughs> which is really discipline, uh, which is really helpful. But but uh, I was a couple of years into my um, my television career okay. and, and film career um, before I received my MBA. Good, good. So I got uh, the other thing about that is that I got to practice. You know, you you do if you're taking a course, you know, on Wednesday night, you can go back and practice what you learned in some cases mm -hmm. on Thursday, you know, mm -hmm. Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. So Good. that was Thank helpful. You. Thank you. Well, that's, I think that's important for us all to remember that that continuing learning sometimes is full time, sometimes it's part time, and we fit it in with the other things that we have going on in our lives. Yeah. And that clearly was quite a commitment to drive back and forth from Chicago to conclude your master's. Some late nights, but some very it was worth late it. nights. <laughs> I was not going to give up at that point. <laughs> good, good. So I'd like to turn the conversation to philanthropy. Um, and I think one of the interesting things um, about talking about philanthropy is thinking about where we first learn it. And we all probably have different people who have inspired us or different things that happen in our lives that cause us to think about being philanthropic, and I'm wondering what that looks like for you. Where, where did you first learn about philanthropy? Yeah, my parents, I, I have to say just I, my parents, I, I don't remember a time when I didn't know or understand that my parents were giving back in some way. And, you know, there were a lot of times when I knew they didn't have a lot of money. Um, I felt they gave um, what they could to, you know, uh, primarily local causes mm -hmm. here in Iowa City, but they also taught me, you know, the, that the what we all say, you know, you have your time, your talent, and your treasure, the three T's to give. And, um, you know, I watched my dad as I grew up um, as a business leader, you know, giving a lot of uh, time to the Chamber of Commerce, to Rotary. He served as um, chair of the Mercy Hospital Foundation Board for many years. So I watched that sort of, you know, talent and time um, philanthropy. And then my mother was a full-time homemaker, but she really used her time and her creativity um, in service of her kids. And, you know, my favorite memory of my mom is um, directing and producing The Wizard of Oz for my Girl Scout troop. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and actually being a marketer as well because somehow we ended up performing, really, at halftime of an Iowa basketball game at the old field house. The, the wiz you're off to see the wizard. So <laughs> anyway, um, so I just, you know, I think I, I, I credit the two of them with really get, somehow, you know, just giving me that understanding of this is what you do and this is how you do it. And I would like for everyone to know that Kathy's mom still lives here. She does. In Iowa she City. Does, yes. We're happy that she is here, um, 95 years old. Yes, she is so. 95. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so if our records are correct, your first gift to the University of Iowa was three years after you graduated, and it was $15, um, which is awesome. Didn't know that. It's awesome, yeah, yeah. Henry and Tippy only gave five. I, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but his was a few years. With inflation, it's probably. <laughs> we are grateful for both. We are deeply grateful for both. Uh, I guess I'm interested in, um, 
as, as you became more able to be more engaged in the life of the University of Iowa and to be more supportive, how did, you, how did you decide where you wanted to make your impact at the university? Well, I think it's, first of all, sort of where you decide you want to make your impact. And, and my husband, Keith, and I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, it's sort of what, where can you make a difference and how do you do that? And so I guess the first thing that we look for is uh, for an organization that has a mission that we believe in and for an organization or an entity that, that has strong stewardship. In other words, we feel really confident that they'll effectively utilize mm -hmm. the money that, the funds that we have to give. And so certainly, Iowa, you know, we can check that box on, on, um, on both counts, uh, specifically as it involves our giving to higher education. Um, I would say that, you know, we, we both agree that um, it's, it's probably the, certainly if not the major, one of the major issues that we face as a country and as a society today is the, uh, that education gap. And, and we think it's, uh, both of us believe that it's, it's really critical to, um, to the future to help in any way increase access to higher education and then to provide whatever maximum benefit to the people who have the access. So that's sort of how we frame it mm -hmm. in our minds. And, and then, as we continue to discuss it, it's, it's um, so how can you get what I like to call the force multiplier effect? You know, how can you um, get, how, how can you do something that increases the value or the impact in more than an additive way? And so, um, Keith's background is in higher ed administration. My background's in business. So we've sort of chosen to focus on, in both areas, um, uh, here at Iowa and then at his alma mater, Indiana, on uh, developing, in my case, strong business leaders, and in his case, developing strong teachers. And you know, that's sort of the force multiplier in the sense that there are literally thousands and thousands of people that can be impacted by business leaders mm -hmm. and by teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's why over the years we've kind of honed in on those two areas. Um, in terms of business leaders, I actually think that we don't have enough business leaders, we aren't getting enough fast enough, and it's really important. Corporations have a huge impact on all our lives in really direct and indirect ways. And we need to have the point of view, the perception and the leadership skills that women bring to the table just because otherwise we only have part of the picture. In uh, the case, I'll just say a, you know, a little bit about our philanthropy at Indiana. Um, uh, we've started the Jepson International Scholars Program, and it really came out of our experience on 9-11 um, mm -hmm. in New York City. And, you know, as anybody who was there that day and in the following weeks um, knows, there were just a lot of sort of soul searching and discussion about sort of what happened and what can we do about it, both right there and then certainly, but also in a bigger picture sense. And, and again, we really feel like education is a big key. The lack of education, in some ways, the lack of tolerance in a broad worldview certainly contributed to that. And so um, our scholars program at Indiana basically gives student teachers the opportunity, um, funds them to do their student teaching in third world countries. And you know, it's our feeling that these teachers, many of whom come back and teach in the Midwest, then will have um, a much broader, um, more tolerant and more insightful worldview as they teach 
elementary and high school students. May it be true. Yeah. What a, what a wonderful uh, vision yeah. for that. I think it's interesting to um, have all of us recognize the kind of thoughtful conversation and contemplation that goes behind some of those decisions that you're talking about and the value that we, um, the time and the value and the thought that should go into those conversations as we're contemplating our own philanthropy and decisions that we're making. Um, I, I appreciate your insights on what has inspired what you and Keith have chosen to do and how you're trying to accomplish real um, fundamental values. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think it's really important and I don't, I don't think it matters. I, I'm not sure I was, I gave, I think I gave the same level of thought when I gave the $15 really mm -hmm. as now. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think it's just important for people to, to well, you know, to, to be really be interested and passionate about what they do with their time, mm -hmm. talent, or treasure. Mm -hmm. Speaking of your time, you um, provide very important leadership to a number of organizations. So we've already spoken about the University of Iowa Center for Advancement Board and looking forward to our board meeting that starts uh, with the executive committee this afternoon and moves on to the full board meeting tomorrow. You also, though, serve on um, an, an equally important board called the Association of Governing Boards that really um, is a national organization devoted to good governance for institutions of higher learning. And I wonder if you'd be willing to talk just a little bit about that national view and perspective on the importance of good governance for universities across the country and how that volunteer role that you have with that organization also supports the kind of um, commitments that you have. Yeah, it's, um, HEB is, is, is a fascinating organization and you know, you're, you're are responsible for my mm -hmm. involvement really with them. Um, Lynette, when I first um, uh, was going to be chair of the foundation board, suggested I go to their annual meeting. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, it's a, it was a really um, uh, good fit with how I've sort of thought about my life and my professional life since I sort of retired from the corporate world. And, you know, one of the things that, that I thought about was when, when you sort of have that freedom from, from corporate America, you sort of say, so, so how am I going to structure this and what am I going to do? And for me, I said, I, I won't only want to, first of all, I only want to do things with people I like and, um, <laughs> for, or, and for organizations where um, what I think they're doing is meaningful. And then I said, well, so there has to be some sort of quid pro quo. So I really, I only want to do things where I feel like I can learn something novel and complex, something that's new for me and something that's complicated, which they say is the thing that keeps uh, our brains working as, as we age. And on the other hand, I want to do something where the organization can, I have some sort of uh, experience or skill that, that I can provide. So for me, um, AGB has been a real opportunity to understand a new field, which is higher education policy, which, as I've been saying you know, over the past 15, 20 minutes here, is, is I think it's critical for our future, and I think it's important. So AGB really does look at um, uh, boards of trustees and foundation boards and, and the individuals who are on those boards and and tries to say, you know, th these, um, or these structures are really important and you need to understand, you know, almost all of us are volunteers, you need to understand about how boards work if you haven't had that experience and about how higher education works in order to actually be strong fiduciary um, members of these governing boards. And so I, I think they really hold us all to a standard that's at least as strong, if not maybe stronger, than corporations hold their boards. It's, um, there are just, it's an incredibly insightful organization and um, they really do 
great work, I think, in terms of trying to ensure that some of the issues that have, you know, have arisen on other campuses, um, at least are lessons we all can learn about how to do things differently or better, or you know, aren't, aren't repeated. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have a full array from the last year or two of of situations where I think trustee boards have failed their institutions. So it's, I, I found it to be really um, uh, a wonderful experience, and I thank you for yes. uh, wow. introducing me to them. Yeah. So you have one other one that <laughs> even more people will have heard of uh, that you're involved with that really combines what you've mm -hmm. said in terms of your own expertise and your interest in things, and I'm sure it's really quite complicated as well and that's the Big Ten Network Board. Can you share yes. just a little bit about that experience also? Yes, yes. well, um, yes, I was invited, um, I think through Gary Barta here at Iowa to join the uh, Big Ten Network Board uh, several years ago, and that board, it's a, it's a partnership between Fox and the Big Ten Conference. So I spent most of, of my own career um, in organizations which were a partnership between either media companies or um, other entities. So um, I'm pretty familiar with, with that structure. And um, so I uh, sit on the board as, as a representative of the Big Ten Conference along with Jim Delaney, who is the commissioner and the, uh, his general counsel. And then there are four members from the Fox side. And it's interesting, I mean, it's, it's really, um, uh, the Big Ten Network, I do recall, and this was well before I was on the board, uh, when they announced it and when they were trying initially to get distribution, um, you know, having sort of been there, done that, I remember thinking, oh, this is, who <laughs> <laughs> would not, you know, I didn't envy them the task. And um, truly, the Big Ten Network has become really the premier um, regional sports entertainment network in the country. So um, I'm very proud to be on the board. It's, a, it's a, again, it's a fascinating journey as is uh, television in general these days. But it's um, you know I'm, I'm a sports fan and an Iowa fan, so it's really it's been very fun for me. Well, we're grateful for your service on that too, <laughs> and, and we're all glad that the Big Ten <laughs> Network is there. Um, so thinking. Uh, sort of transitioning from service, uh, which is part of philanthropy, and then coming back to the students that we have with us today. Um, obviously, when we're young and just getting started, there's not a lot of capacity to make gifts. Um, but what would you say to those students as they think about continuing the kind of life of service that they may have started as undergraduates um, and going into some of their first professional roles as they, they think about how to give back? Well, I, you know, I, I'm going to um, channel a Phil Talk speaker from a couple of years ago, um, Ted Waite. I don't know if any of you saw Ted when he was here. Ted um, was one of the founders of Gateway Computers, and he's a native of Sioux City, and he mm -hmm. was your, your guest um, a, a couple of years ago. And I, it, it stuck with me what he said, which is, you know, first of all, find, find something you're passionate about that you really believe in. And um, then do your homework and learn more about that area, that organization, whatever it is. And then, based on that, sort of determine how you can best give back. Um, in what capacity. Um, uh, and, and uh, I, you know, I really, it stuck with me because I think a lot of people kind of do it in the other direction. And, and so I, I think he's right. Um, I think that you, I mean, there, there are so many opportunities now here at the University of Iowa to give of your time, I know. I mean, you know, Dance Marathon is it's downstairs incredibly today. <laughs> successful. So, you know, it isn't always writing a check, but you know, most of us can write a little check and that's a good thing. And there, no, I've found any organization I've ever 
um, been affiliated with or supported, no tech is too small. So um, I think that's good. And uh, you know, I think then we all sort of see how that evolves. Uh, you know, I guess two, two other things occur to me. One is just, you know, a story, like I always, I spent a lot of time in kind of the middle of my career being really, really frustrated about, you know, not being able to spend any time on the volunteer to change the world things that I thought I wanted to do. Like I, I never could find time to go build a house for Habitat for Humanity. And I have the, had this wonderful boss at um, AMC Networks who's still the CEO of, of AMC, Josh Sapan, and I, you know, I was, talking to him one day, I remember, and, and you know, sitting in his office and saying, just, I, you know, I really want to do some of these things, and this, this job, this career is not giving me the time, I'm not finding the time to do them. And he looked at me, and he said, you're running television networks that impact millions and millions of people. We pay you a lot of money, write a check. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so I did, I mean, but you know, it was sort of, I mean, you do what you can when you can do it, mm -hmm. and you have to f kind of find your own way in that. And so I th that was really good advice. And, and I guess the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, never, don't forget, as you start out in your professional life, sort of the quasi-philanthropic value that your presence in a workplace can have. I mean, if you, if you have um, your own moral compass and you have strong values, and particularly if you manage people, you know, you are, if you bring your authentic self to work every day and you're conscious of the impact you have on people, you can, you know, you, you'll impact people and you will give back in ways that you will never know and, you know, only sometimes be told that, well, la 20 years ago you did this and it really changed the way I think about something or the, what I became. Or so I think particularly early in your career, it's, it's important to really understand that you can give back in an indirect way as well. I bet I'm not the only one in the room who says, gosh, I'd really like to work for her. And I, I said that the, the other day, and I thought, actually, I do work for her. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> and it's been a joy. I'm, I'm just to, to reflect on that. It's been a joy uh, to work with Kathy in her role as uh, leader of the Center for Advancement. And I would note also the real value that her expertise and um, thoughtfulness and leadership brought when we combined the Alumni Association and the Foundation together into the Center for Advancement. Um, the way she reflects on problems and issues and the kind of uh, thoughtfulness that she brings to that is, is indeed authentic. I, mm. I can affirm that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's a joy. Um, so we've talked a lot about why you and Keith have chosen to do what you've done in, in thoughtfulness for your philanthropy. And I'd like to just um, delve a little bit more into if you feel like there is a different way that young women should contemplate their philanthropy as they're going into the workforce. So for example, the, the young women who you support through the MBA program, if they were asking you about how to approach that particular part of their next step in their lives, what would be your counsel to them? Well, I think first of all, I, uh, sort of, first of all, basically, approach it in the same way that men approach it, which is that your presence and your participation make a difference. And, um, then I think I would add, you know, you have to sort of add to that the fact that um, there probably aren't as many women with the resources to um, do to, as men in terms of, of philanthropy. So, so that sort of says, um, and I guess this is sort of maybe perhaps subconsciously what the way I think about it, which is that 
I, I guess I think m a little more critically, perhaps, and strategically about what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm sort of pickier and more um, uh, determined about the impact because I feel like I'm probably representing I feel like I'm a representative of a lot of women who don't have the resources in to, to be able to give back. So I guess uh, on the one side I would say it's the same. You're there, you need to be in the room, you need to be adamant about what you believe and, and let that, what you do reflect your values. And you're doing it for a lot of other people who aren't able, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the real um, values that your parents instilled and that that was the first philanthropy that you saw. And then you went into the world and had a remarkable career in leadership. Was there anyone else along the way who was a mentor to you as you think about your service and your philanthropy? Well, I, you know, I, I never had the traditional mentor in a career sense, but um, I have a life partner who I consider to be a career mentor and a philanthropic mentor. So, uh, you know, I will just um, say that that from a career standpoint, uh, my husband Keith um, was a, an uh, unbelievably unselfish and insightful mentor. And, and the two big career moves that I made, one was um, to become um, the head of Bravo uh, when it was about to close its doors and nobody wanted this job. And it, you know, I, was, I was offered the opportunity be, because actually no one wanted the job. And it was, a jo it was a double jump for me. I was internal to the company, but it was, you know, I, I had not been a department head. I was managing a regional sales office. And so I had never run marketing. I had never run programming. I was in Chicago. They were asking me to move to New York. And I was like, you know, everybody was saying, well, you should do it, you should do it. And I was like, terrified. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, my, uh, Keith said, look, you, and, and I have a husband who's also brutally honest. So he tells me, you know, when I'm, good at something when I'm not good at something. He said, you can do this. Not only can you do it, you'll be successful at it. You really know how to take an organization from one point A to point B. You should do this. And he did that at considerable um, uh, sort of risk and inconvenience to his own career. So, you know, if, if a mentor is um, you know, really supposed to help move you from point A to point B and give you confidence. I mean, it's, it was, it's wonderful to be married to someone who is also a mentor like that. He did the same thing. You know, the first time I had to move halfway across the country and take a job that, you know, had a chance of, of um, where I had a chance of not succeeding. The next time I had to move to a different country to do that, but he, he did it twice. So, um, and He's also a philanthropic mentor from the standpoint that, you know, I was fortunate enough, I did not have to pay my way through college. My parents paid my way through college. Um, Keith left for um, Illinois State University um, with, I don't know, $10, and really worked three jobs, and, um, you know, his college experience made him very passionate about student financial aid. And so uh, his subsequent 45-year career um, uh, was in student financial aid. And, and so um, he's helped me to understand more about the challenges that most students face that, that you know, I personally did not have to face. So yeah, he's, he's my mentor hero. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. Kathy, I'm reminded that I think the first time we met was about 11 years ago when you returned to participate in the Iowa Women's Leadership Conference. 
and to be one of the speakers when that program was just initially <laughs> starting. Yeah. And I remember hearing you speak at that conference and thinking, wow, mm -hmm. wow, I would really like to get to know her. And I, I really um, cherished what you shared at that time and the way in which you presented it to a conference of eight or 900 women. Um, and to have the privilege of having this conversation uh, 10, 11, 12 years later, uh, whenever that was, is, is a real gift to me. So we're grateful to you for all that you do for your alma mater, for what you do for higher education nationally and internationally, um, and for the ways that you continue to give back and to teach us after this um, remarkable set of experiences that you've had so the rest of us can learn from it. So I hope all of you will join me in thanking Kathy for our conversation this morning. Thank you to all of you for being with us. We have a, a wonderful mix today of um, students who are with us from a variety of classes. We have several members of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement Board who have chosen to come today and to um, listen. We've got some friends from Regina mm -hmm. where Kathy went to school as well um, and some of our colleagues from the Center for Advancement. So it's been a joy to be able to be here with you. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great day. <laughs>